Okay, so welcome everybody and welcome to those listening online. So we're moving on past the fall 2021. That's beautiful. Okay. Spring, spring 2022. Just ignore that. Um, so anyway, uh, we're going to be moving on. And actually, now the class is going to actually getting into real oceanography, right? So we've just been kind of prepping you in a way to actually study oceanography to these backgrounds. So now we're going to study real oceanography. And our first thing we're going to talk about is basically it's the ocean floor. So we'll be looking at the ocean floor in great detail. And so the lectures, next two lectures this week is just on the ocean floor. It's called ocean basins. Okay. So we're going to study everything about the shape and topography and how we study that too and how we get the, the bathymetry, it's called the bathymetry, the depth of the oceans all over the world. Okay. So that's what we're going to be doing this whole week. And after that, we're going to look at sediment. We're going to have a whole week on sediment, ocean sediment. And then after that, I know that you're not excited about that now. Is, that, or is anybody excited about ocean sediment? Nobody? OK. Usually I get one or two. No, I've never gotten anybody because they asked that. But, um, no, people like, you'll, you'll, you're going to like, I'm not going to promise you you're going to love ocean sediment, but I think you'll like it a little bit more than you do right now. So, so. OK. So we'll do sediments next week, and then um, ocean water structure, chemistry, all that. So this is going to be like really getting into oceanography. Okay. So anyway, um, let's just get on to the stuff. So first of all, we want to know a little bit about how we study the ocean depths, right? So I got to turn to the right page here. Number eight, ocean basin. So what's this word bathymetry? So um, it's just one of those words that come from Greek roots and breaks down pretty easily. Bathymetry, bath, just like you bath, take a bath at home, right? The bath, it's literally, it's the same thing, right? It's, the bath means depths, so, so water depth. Bath means over water depth, okay, deep water. Metry is just like metric system, it's just measuring, okay? So it's measuring how deep the water is. That's all bathymetry means. Okay, we're just measuring how deep the ocean is. Okay? Now, in the old days, how do you think that they measured the depths of the ocean? With a rope. Yeah, just, and you can see, and they've been doing it that way for a long time. Look at this woodcut from, this is from like the 16th, actually earlier than that, it's from like the 14th century. And they've been doing it like that for a long time, right? Just wait on a rope, see how much rope goes down, and that's how deep the water is there. Okay. And you know what? It's kind of crazy because that's how they were doing it for thousands of years, all the way up until like the 1920s. That's how they were measuring the depths of the ocean. There was no other way to measure the depth of the ocean. Just wait on a rope. That's an example of the kind of um, depth sounding uh, equipment that they would use back in like the early, early 20th centuries, early 1900s, right? So, it's the most obvious way. That's how the Challenger did it. Remember we talked about HMS Challenger? That's how they did it. And of course they had though, they got a little bit more sophisticated because they had miles of rope, right? Because does anybody remember what was the deepest point that they measured? It hasn't. Well, it's, it's named after the Challenger. So that's the most obvious name. Challenger, Challenger Deep, right? Challenger Deep is the deepest point of the ocean. It's like 36,000 feet deep, right? So it's, it's very, very deep. So, you know, think about this. They thought that they actually, somebody actually thought to bring 36,000 feet of rope. Not a lot. I mean, that's like seven mile, over seven miles of rope, or about seven miles of rope. So somebody thought of bringing that much rope. So it's pretty amazing. So that's how sounding, so by the way, if you ever hear this term sounding, that's what sounding, sounding means figuring out how deep something is, how deep the water is. And so they'd have that, just to wait on a rope. And uh, that's how they went, you know, they went all around measuring depths all over. They found the deepest point, which is still, by the way, today considered the deepest point, recognizes the deepest point in the ocean, Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, which is off the coast of Guam. So that's right, right around there, okay? Oh, sorry, right around, sorry, right around there. Guam is kind of close, close to Japan, so south, south, east of Japan. Okay. So, um, so two and three have the same answer? 
Yeah, it's the same thing. How is it done in the past? How did they make sounding measurements? It was all this. One thing, though, you could put for number three, though, is that they had a lot of rope, and it was too much work. Can you imagine guys, like, hauling up these things, like, seven miles of rope with a weight, right? And they used very heavy weights, right, because they wanted it to go straight down. They don't want it to drift along with the currents. So the one thing that they added, and this is actually a woodcut showing... Um, what they had on the real HMS Challenger, and they had a steam winch, so it was a steam powered, a steam powered winch that would, that would um, actually wind up the rope for them. So, but that was like the only real. This is not the. A real steam power. Anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting. Because they're very tedious, you can imagine, very tedious, and a lot of labor to actually have to measure things that way. So, what happened? Well, um, you all know this, right? HMS Titanic. 1912, the movie came out in 2000, whatever, I can't remember, maybe it was 2000. I think it was 90s. Was it 90s? Was it like 98 or something? I can't remember, but it came out. I can't remember that guy's name. James Cameron, and then James Cameron directed it, and Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, that has nothing to do with it. but. But uh, this was a big deal, right? So this, you can imagine what a monumental loss that was on the maiden voyage of the Titanic, which you know, was tr made a tremendous impression on people. So uh, of course, you know what sunk the Titanic, right? The U-boat? Yeah. Was it a U-boat? Was it really? I don't know. It was, yeah, it hit iceberg. Yeah, it hit iceberg. So, so that'd, be, that'd be really interesting. Yeah. It was a U-boat, right? Yeah, it hit iceberg. So anyway, what happened is scientists at the time wanted to come up with a way of detecting icebergs in the dark at night, you know, you're going around, you want to make sure you don't run into an iceberg. So uh, this guy, Reginald Fessenden, invented this iceberg detector and echo depth sounder. And what this thing did, so literally it's a big drum. And it's, it works very simply. They put this thing in the water, and the big drum makes a big boom noise, right? It's a big noise. The noise travels down, it bounces off of the, the bottom of the ocean, and if, as long as the noise is loud enough, it bounces off and it comes back. And literally, people would have their ear to something, listening for the echo of the boom to come back. And that's all it did. It was very, very simple, right? And it's kind of crazy that that's still, in principle, what we use today to measure the depth of the ocean. That's actually our most accurate and best way of measuring the depth of the ocean is listening for the loud boom that comes back. But of course, we don't use um, the same, we don't use audible frequencies now, we use um, ultrasonic frequencies, so that's a difference. Okay, and so the same thing could be done to detect icebergs, right? Because you could shoot this drum, you could aim the um, sound waves ahead of the ship, and then listen for any echo that might come, come bounce off the um, surface of an iceberg. Okay, so that's how it detected icebergs but it could be used to measure the depths of the ocean too. So that was in 1914. So 1914, they had the first technology to, to measure the depth of the ocean a little bit, a little bit more sophisticated way. Kai, did you have a question? Are you, you, said, you said they shot the drum? Is that what you said, they shot the drum? Oh, um, they just made a big boom on this drum, and that's how, it, that's how it generated the sound that would go down through the, through the uh, depths and, so they're just, they just needed a big sound. They just needed to be a loud sound. So, what's the difference between the drum on the ship and the sound? Well, that's, they just had, I don't know how they actually generated the sound with the drum, but they had a big, let's just say they had a big drum that somehow, I'm not exactly sure how it generated the sound, but it generated the sound with the drum that, 
you know, with the track. They just needed to make a very loud sound that could actually go all the way through the depths and return. So, yeah. But anyway, that's how that's how things are done still to this day. It's just that we use for now we don't use frequencies that you can hear. We actually use ultrasonic frequencies, and we have a what thing that's called a transducer that can pick up the pick up those ultrasonic waves that bounce off the bounce off the depths or whatever else you know. Other things too. Okay, so that's how echo sounding works. In, I mean, it's you know, relatively simple, and it's just listening for an echo, right? You're making a loud sound. You're listening for the echo that's bouncing off of the ocean floor. Okay. So this is how um, this is how you make these calculations. So this is one math problem that you'll have to do on the next test. So I know it's, you have to like get ready for the next test, but just let, let you know. Um, so you should know for the next test how to do a calculation like this. So let's say that a, uh, a you know a boat emits this sound signal, an acoustic signal, okay? It's going to travel through the water depths, it's going to bounce off, and it's going to return, okay? So you see that the longer that it takes for the sound signal to return, the, the deeper the ocean. But remember that the sound signal has to make two trips, right? Do you all see that? The sound signal has to make two trips. It has to go down, and it has to come back up, right? So we're actually going to divide the time T for time, we're going to divide the time by two, because it only because you you only want to count the first journey, right? You don't want to count the whole thing because it goes down and back up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the time divided by two by the velocity of sound in the water in the ocean, and that's going to give us a depth. Okay, so it's just Velocity, the speed, times two, sorry, times time divided by two. Now, the speed of sound in water is actually pretty complicated. The speed of sound in water is actually pretty complicated. It depends on a lot of things. For this class, you don't need to know all the complicating factors, right? There's actually a really complicated formula they use to calculate this stuff. It depends on temperature and pressure and depth and density, all these things. So it gets complicated. But just it's, it's fine for this class to just say that the speed of sound in water is between 450 and 1570. Okay, So for all calculations that you do in this class, you can use any number between those two. Okay, So you might just want to take 1450 as the number to use, but I just kind of want to let you know, though, that it's, it's actually reality. It's complicated. So, yeah, Gavin? So for 7, we can use any number between Yeah, those? you can. You can use any number. And, I, and just kind of tell me which number, you know, write it on there. Show your work so I know what number you're using. But if you want to just use 1450, a lot of people just, for this class, they just memorize 1450, and that's fine. But um, 14, and keep in mind that the, the uh, units, it's meters per second, okay? So 400, 4, 1450 meters per second, 1,450 meters per second. And then you can give me the final answer in meters, OK? Now, the, how deep is the ocean? Well, it's anywhere between you know, 0 and, well, it can get, I guess, Challenger Deep can be you know, whatever, 36,000 feet, which is it's like 10,000, you know, over 10,000 meters, right? But, um, Usually, average depth is around like four kilometers or four thousand meters. Okay, that's kind of average. So your answer should be, you know, usually your answer is going to be like thousands of meters. Okay, two, three, four thousand meters. Okay, so for number seven, you're going to take four point eight. That's the time. Divide it by two and multiply it by the velocity, which you can take as fourteen fifty. So is everybody good with that? Can you remember that formula for the test? Yes, you might want to. No, but can you, you can try. Yeah, you just get it. But uh, yeah, but 
depth equals velocity times time over two. Okay, so we good? Do, do you all get an answer for that? Yeah, so I just want to let you know that it's, it actually is really complicated, right? So it, the speed of sound in water actually depends on density, it depends on the temperature, it depends on the salinity, and, and it's complicated because all those things vary as a function. You'll see when we start studying structure of the ocean, actual like structure of the ocean with depth, you'll see all these things change with depth. They're not constant. So it's, it's, it ends up being a very complex formula. So anyway, I think I asked, what do I ask for number eight? Like some of the, yeah, some of the things. So is it constant? Is the speed of sound constant in water, seawater? Yeah, it's not. It depends on a lot of different things. It depends on density, temperature, salinity. Okay. So a lot of stuff factors in. Eight is just a yes or no question. And then nine, you're actually listing out those things. So the, the speed of sound in water increases with density, it decreases with temperature, and it decreases with salinity. So you can explain that a little bit below. And you, you see you have a little bit of space to write. Oh yeah, be careful with that because I noticed that some people they lose points on the lecture assignments because they don't, it'll say explain or describe or something and they'll just put one word answer so make sure you, it says that, explain a little bit. Okay, so we all good? Good? Okay, I'm going to move on now. You don't need to understand all this, just know that in real life there are these, these effects that do occur. All right, now um, one thing I want to talk about is, uh, you know, I went to school at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I used to live in the town right next to it, which is Ypsilanti, Michigan. So that's that thing, I think on number 10, I talked a little bit Ypsilanti, Michigan. So anyway, this is a lady who's actually from Ypsilanti, Michigan, named Marie Tharp. She's a real big deal in oceanography, because in the 1950s, besides just being kind of groundbreaking, because she was you know, a, a woman in a male-dominated field, she also um, made a, really a lot of important contributions in understanding the seafloor. So she compiled all the data and put together all of the bathymetric data to compile the first maps of the seafloor. So these are some of the first maps of the seafloor that Marie Tharp compiled in the 1950s. And she's from Ypsilanti. She wrote, um, you know, last, uh, by the way, in case you were like thinking about doing the research paper, like last semester I had a, a, a young woman who, there's actually a book called Soundings that's about this, about Marie Tharp. And, um, somebody did a really nice research paper last semester about her and about that book. So it's kind of an interesting research. She's got a pretty interesting character. So. Um, she led an interesting life. So some people have done that, you know, for their research paper here. Oh, and by the way, if you st if you didn't like your grade, and you're thinking, oh, gosh, I better do a research paper, you could still do that. It can be, you know, you can res you can turn it in late, so it's okay. So I still take it. So just 
FYI. Okay? So moving on. Now, nowadays we use something called multi-beam echo sounding. And so multi-beam is a lot more complicated because what we do is it what we can do is we can send out multi-beams, multiple beams, right? And we can get a much wider swath of the seafloor at a time. And what's kind of cool, the way this works is each one uses a slightly different frequency. So that way, when it comes back to the transducer, uh, the transducer is the thing that intercepts the return signal, it's able to kind of like figure out which, you know, which um, beam came from where. Okay, and so with that, it's able to kind of figure out more of the shape, like if you get a better like three-dimensional image of the seafloor. So this is very sophisticated. This is very sophisticated now. And it's pretty cool because nature has already done this, right? Nature already figured out a way to do this. So there's lots of animals that use echo sounding. And actually, by the way, they, they use ultrasonic waves, right? Some of them use things that are audible, but a lot of them use ultrasonic. So like dolphins, for instance, can use, they use ultrasonic waves to do this. And they actually have, you know how dolphins have this big fat head? They're like a big fat thing in their head in the front? You ever wonder what that, it's not their brain. It's not the brain. I always thought they had big, huge brains or something. They don't. There's actually a thing in the front called a melon. And the melon is the thing that is like the transducer. It intercepts all of those um, echo sounding data and it, it's able to make sense of it and send it to the brain and then they can figure out, you know. Like Dory. What's that? Like the movie Dory. Is it like the movie Dory? The, yeah, oh. there's a the world that can do that. Oh really? I, I haven't. I've never seen it. Bats can do that too, right? But then cats. Bats. Oh, bats can do it too. Yeah, bats do that too, right? I was like, bats. bats do that. Meowing <laughs> receives in their brain. I don't know. Maybe. So anyway, but that's sonar, right? So you've probably heard that term before, sonar, right? It's it's a it's a it's referring to this ultrasonic ultrasonic uh, echolocation, right? Echo. At figuring out the depths through ultra, uh, ultrasonic waves. Okay, now um, why do we use, okay, do you know what I mean by ultrasonic? So ultrasonic waves are sound waves, so ultrasonic waves are sound waves, but they're at a high frequency, so high that you can't hear it. So has anyone ever heard like dog whistle or something like that? I mean, and you, you blow on it, you can't hear anything, but dogs can hear it, right? So, so it's, it's because they can hear at frequencies we can't hear at. So when we refer to this ultrasonic waves, that's what we're talking about. They're like really high frequency waves that, um, that and, um, we can't hear, but they are, they're just sound waves. They're just high frequency sound waves. Now, why do they use ultrasonic and not audible sound? The reason is because um, it doesn't get absorbed by the water as easily. So it just transmits through the water instead of getting absorbed. So because it transmits through the water, instead of getting absorbed, it can travel further. So that's why we use ultrasonic. So the ocean water does not absorb that sound. And you, you, you know that, right? Like, like um, has anyone ever, I notice this a lot, maybe you haven't noticed, but has anyone ever like walked into a room that's all carpet? and then you're talking in the room and things are pretty quiet. And then if you go into a room that's like tile or hardwood floors, it's like really echoey, right? It's because some materials absorb sound, like carpet absorbs sound, and other materials reflect it, right? So it's the same kind of thing. The, the ocean water is pretty good at absorbing the sound. So we don't want that. We, don't, we, want those, we want those frequencies to travel as far as they can to go through the ocean, right? So that's why we use ultrasound. So look at this, this is, isn't that crazy? How good the ultra, this is multi-beam echo, you know, multi-beam uh, echo sounding. So they can actually figure out, that's a, that's a shipwreck obviously. And look at how much detail they get of that. It's like a perfect three-dimensional image, right? It's like the same thing they use, I mean, it's actually the same thing like ultrasound, like ultrasounds, like if a lady's pregnant and they can get like these, have you seen like they get like really good three-dimensional images of, like, baby in there and they can even do it like the you know 4 d so it's, you can see the movement and stuff so it's, it's really sophisticated now what they can do with ultra um, ultrasonic imaging is very sophisticated so 
you could see that. I just find that so amazing because you know nobody went down there to draw that, right? They just all just from echo echo sounding echo location. So yeah, nowadays you have like a big air gun. So they have a big air gun that they fire to make the ultrasonic waves, and they have all these recorders trailing in back of the research vessels, and that's how they. That's those are the transducers that pick up the signal. So that's that's how it all works. And you know, it's also one thing I want to I want to show you. Also, you get an echo from the bottom of the seafloor, but those those waves will also go into the sediment. And they, what'll happen is they'll go through the sediment, bounce off the bedrock that's below the sediment. So we also get depth of sediment from this too. And you can see you could see a lot. You could really see a lot. See, this is, this is showing, this is exactly, this is actually real data that they get from, um, this is actually, I think, from the Oki, remember I talked about the Oki, the uh, Okiness Explorer, right? They do echo sounding. This is really what they end up with, the kind of maps that they end up with. So this is the bottom of the ocean, right? But what's all this, see all these lines here? Those are all the layers of sediment that, they, that they're able to read and pick up on. Okay, so does that make sense? Do you all see that? So we're able, it's amazing, because we're getting also the depth of the sediment also. And all the layers, and this is how the oil, you know who loves this, the oil companies, right? Because they figure they can see the oil traps and things like that there. So they use this a lot. They use that a lot. Especially in the Gulf of Mexico, because you know what we got in the Gulf of Mexico. So we've got a lot of gas and oil, so. All right, so, and by the way, the kind of way that they do this in real life is they kind of, it's kind of like a lawnmower kind of go back and forth, but they just, um, see, they don't do anything in between here. They just kind of fill in the gaps, and so they kind of space out the, the lines like that. Do you all see what that is? See, these bright patches have actually been um, actually been measured with multi-beam echo sounding, but everything in between is just kind of filled in. Best guess, right? This is a very time-intensive program. It's very, very time-intensive. So. We've actually only mapped like a tiny part of the seafloor this way. Like, I mean like 1% if that. We've mapped this way, because this is very time intensive. Okay? Okay, so echo sounding's great, but it would take, at our current rate that we do this, you know, like we have the GQ and the Okinos Explore and all these other research vessels doing this. At our current rate, it would take hundreds of years to map out the entire ocean, which is what we're doing, with echo sounding. So it's too slow. So what do we do in between? We do the satellite altimetry. Okay. So I already gave you an introduction to all these things, but now I'm going in more detail. So satellite altimetry gives us less detail. It gives us less detail, but we can do a much wider swath of the ocean. All right, so how does satellite altimetry work? So it's very simple, really. You know, there's a satellite that's orbiting Earth. It has a laser, and it's able to shoot the laser down to the surface. Okay, this is something I want to make very clear because it's very, it's very confusing for students at first. The laser hits the surface. It's figuring out the surface of the water. It's not measuring the depth directly. It's measuring the height of the water level, okay? It's measuring the height of the water level. And of course, this thing changes all the time because there's waves and there's tides and all sorts of things. But it measures the height of the water level. Now the thing is, the height of the water level, this is something that you'll learn a thousand times in this class. It comes up almost every class. Everybody comes in, or not everybody, but a lot of people probably come into oceanography thinking that the ocean is totally flat, right? Wouldn't you imagine it? Would you just imagine the ocean's totally flat? Like if you just had to guess? I mean, I know there's waves on it, but besides the waves and the tides, we would just imagine maybe it's totally flat. Okay, well, Clarissa does. Clarissa has good intuition. Well, because like, well, like the sea bars and stuff like that, right? Sure, yeah. So, so... But um, this is the thing. There's actually hills of water and valleys of water in the ocean. Yeah, there's hills of water and valleys of water. 
Does that make sense? Does that seem weird that there would be hills and valleys of water? It's, it's kind of weird, right? So there's actually hills and valleys of water. But, yeah, but we're not talking about the depth. We're talking about like the, the actual surface of the water is actually higher in some places and lower in others. Okay? So why? Isn't that weird? Because wouldn't you imagine a hill of water would just go like, yeah. spread out, right? But it doesn't do that because this is why. If there's a, let's say, a hill or a mountain or something on the ocean floor, that actually has more gravity. So this thing has, that hill has gravity. And it pulls the water around it and heaps up water on top of it. Does that make sense? So it actually, it actually works that way. It actually, it, it, there's an induced gravity, it's called, and it pulls the water and kind of pulls the water on top of it. So there's a little hill. They're not very big. They're, you know, maybe they're just inches high. But it's enough that it can be picked up with the satellite. The satellite laser readings can actually figure it out, okay? Because even if it's only a couple inches high, the hill, it can detect it. Because it can detect millimeters. You know, it's very, very accurate, very precise. So, this thing heaps up the water, and it creates a hill. And so, there's a reflection, there's a similarity between the shape of the ocean, the ocean surface, and what's going on in the ocean floor underneath. So that's how we're able to figure out ocean depth from that. So does that make sense? Okay, just be careful because I, I, I'll ask people to explain this on the test and a lot of people will think, oh, the laser just goes through the water and bounces off the bottom of the seafloor and comes back up. That's not how it works. It works from induced gravity, from the shape of the, the, shape of the um, ocean floor. Okay. Heaping up water or creating these hills or valleys of water. So there you go, that's, that's how it works. Create hills and valleys of water that the, the um, satellites can detect. So satellite altimetry is less detailed, but it, you can do the whole Earth very quickly. I mean, compared to that goes down there. So these are all satellite altimetry maps of the sea floor. Okay. And you, you, know, you can see it gives you a very good general idea of how deep the ocean are in different parts, but it, it doesn't give you the detail you would get with echo sounding. Okay. Um, another big deal, deal with this is satellite altimetry is very, very good at telling us changes to ocean levels. Right? So a lot of people are concerned about like rising sea levels, right? I'm sure you've heard things like that, right? Has everyone heard about stuff? Like global, uh, climate change and the rising sea levels. So, so how do they measure all those things? Well, they measure it with they measure it with satellite altimetry. Okay. It's very very good at detecting changes in sea level. So it actually shows this is actually kind of interesting because it shows you a lot of people think that when the sea levels if they're going to rise, that it would just be the same everywhere, and it's not. Okay. Some places are pretty bad, like off the coast of Japan, but some places notice that there's actually some places the sea levels go down. Did you notice that? And that's all predicted by the like, explosion explain all this, why it changes the way it does. So there's actually some places that that um, sea levels are predicted to go down. So it's very uneven. Okay. So anyway, that's so, so that's all how we the first page of this is just how we you know we actually measure the depths of the sea floor, how we do bathymetry in the in the modern day. So now we're actually going to talk about what does the seafloor look like? What's the shape of the seafloor? And actually, what, what, you know, what do we actually see? So um, one thing that I wanted to point out to you, this is something called a hypsymmetric curve. Something called a hypsymmetric curve. Okay, let me introduce this to you. So what you see on the vertical axis is depth or elevation. Depth or elevation, okay? What you see is the on the horizontal axis is the percent of Earth's surface that is at that elevation. Okay. Now notice that we see one, two peaks. What's kind of interesting is that Earth is very unique 
in the whole solar system, maybe the whole universe as far as we know right now, and that we have two peaks. Most other planets have one, of the terrestrial planets, okay? They only have one. We have two. Does anybody want to make a stab at why we have two? There's two, there's a peak right here where there's a lot of land or a lot of elevation that's around, I don't know, like maybe 500 meters, 700 meters, right? Do you all see that? There's this peak right here. I don't know what that is, maybe 700 or 500 or something. Do you all see what I'm talking about? Okay. That's maybe like, I don't know, 0 0.5. This is in kilometers. It's, I mean, that's what I'm saying, 0 0.5 kilometers, right? Something like that. And there's another one that's about, right, maybe like right there. Okay. So what do those two peaks represent? What's that? Yeah, so are you saying the highest points? Or the, maybe not the highest points, but the most common. Yeah, so like the most common. Because remember, it's distribution. Uh, it's like the percent of Earth's surface. So what these represent are the two types of crust. Remember that we have two types of crust, right? What you see right here is the two types of crust is shown by this, it's called a hypsymmetric curve. Okay? And a hypsymmetric curve shows the distribution of different elevations over Earth's surface. Hypsymmetric curve shows the distribution of different elevations over Earth's surface. And you see two peaks, a bimodal, it's called a bimodal distribution. You see two peaks, one representing the continental crust, the average elevation of the continental crust, and the elevation of the ocean crust. Okay. So you can see the most common depth of the ocean is maybe like, oh, I don't know, like 4,500 meters, 4.5 kilometers or something like that. Could you repeat what you said? Sorry. A hypsometric curve shows the distribution of different elevations over Earth's surface. So what you see here is the most common depth of the ocean Maybe like I don't, you know, I don't. Maybe like 4.5 kilometers or something. That's the most common depth for the ocean. There are some parts of the ocean, small parts, that are up to eight kilometers deep, right? That's like Challenger Deep. There are some places that are not very deep at all, right here. Okay, do you see that? There's quite a bit of the ocean that's just light, like right here, maybe like only 500 meters deep. That's actually the part of the continent that is submerged beneath the water. Okay, that's called the continental shelf. So we'll talk more about that probably maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Okay, so that's hypsometric curve. So that's showing you the distribution of different elevations over Earth's surface and different, also different water depths. So how is the hypsometric curve different than other planets? It's number 13, right? How is it different than other planets? Well, other planets don't have two peaks. They only have one because they don't have, they don't have continental crust. They only have what would be called ocean crust for us. It's basaltic crust. So Venus only has basalt, right? Mars only has basalt. Mercury only has basalt. It's just what would be the considered ocean crust here. They don't have continental crust. Why don't those other planets have continental crust? Why don't they have continental crust? What's needed for continental crust? The water, right? Because the water induces the, the, the volcanism and subduction zones that creates the continental crust. Okay. Does this all sound familiar? I hope, because we've talked about all this with plate tectonics.
Okay, so the most common depth of the ocean is 4,500 meters. The average depth of the ocean, see how the average gets pulled away from this peak, because there's another kind of smaller peak right here of the ocean depth. So the average depth of the ocean is actually about 33,800 meters as average. But the most common depth of the deep ocean is 4,500 meters. Okay. All right, so here's the ocean floor map. There are three main provinces we're going to talk about that are the most important that you know. Those provinces are mid-ocean ridges, abyssal plains, and continental shelves. Those are the three important ones. There are minor features that we'll talk about probably next time, which are ocean trenches, sea mounts, and fracture zones. Okay. And we could actually add to that list because there's more stuff we could talk about too. But um, this should sound a little bit familiar from when we talked about this in plate tectonics, okay? Remember we talked about like trenches, for instance, we talked about trenches in terms of subduction zones and things like this. We talked about mid-ocean ridges in terms of spreading centers, right, the, where, the, where the ocean crust is created. Okay, so this right, see that this ridge right in the center is the mid-ocean ridge, right? So this is taking a look at the Atlantic Ocean. That's a map of the Atlantic Ocean. And what do you find? Well, you have, of course, near the continents, you see these red areas. See how Florida has like a big fat red area surrounding it? Okay, that's, that's all continental shelf. Continental shelf, do you, do you see what I'm talking about? See how like Florida is surrounded by the red? That is, so this is, I probably should explain, this is a depth map, showing a bath, bathymetry map, okay? The red is um, very shallow. So the red represents very shallow. The blue represents very deep, like 4,500 kilometers, 4,500 meters. And the pur purple, gosh, I'm like getting all the It's weird today. Green, the green represents um, kind of medium depth, so maybe like two kilometers deep. Okay. So notice that the, the continents, are surrounded by red, and that's because it's that's the continental shelf. Okay, so I want to make this very clear for you. So number sixteen, and um, we're going to get to number fifteen maybe tomorrow, but let's do number sixteen. What is continental shelf? Continental shelf is the part of the continent that is underwater. Continental shelf is the part of the continent that is underwater. So if you go to the continental shelf, so let's say you go off the coast of Florida, okay? And or I mean it could be, Texas isn't shown here, but let's say you want, let's just say you go to the Padre Island and you start, you walk, you, know, you put your toes in the water, you start walking out. What kind of crust is beneath your feet? Are you in, if, are, is it ocean crust because you're in the ocean? No, it's continental crust, right? So it's just the part of the continent that it happens to be underwater. Now, when sea levels go down, you can, you can imagine the continental shelves actually become smaller, right? When, when the sea levels go up, more of the land is underwater, and the continental shelves become fatter and bigger. Yeah. So that's continental shelf, or it's called continental margin. After that, you go into the deep ocean, okay? So notice that here's the continental margin. This is kind of like a cross-sectional view, so it's showing the depth from a side view. You start off really shallow. Look how shallow you're at. You're only about maybe at most maybe 500 meters deep. Okay, it's pretty shallow. That's at most. You know, so if you started going out, you know, walking off of, uh, let's say that, like for example, our bay. You know how deep our bay gets? Like the deep, what? Not counting the ship channel. The ship channel is 45 feet deep. But not counting the ship channel. You know how deep our bay is? Like Corpus Christi. It's only 14 feet. Not really that much, right? You're, it's pretty shallow, actually. Um, there are part, you know, most of Oso Bay is only like a few feet deep. So it's um, so it's actually pretty shallow over the continents, right? Then you notice it gets very deep, and then you're in the deep ocean, okay? And that's where there's actually ocean crust beneath you, okay? Then it goes up a little bit as you cross the ridge, right? So, because the ridges, remember, they're like 10,000 foot high mountains, right, in the smack dab in the center, okay? 
Okay, so then you get a little higher, you get on the ridge, and then you go back into the abyssal plains. Okay? So that's how that all works. Oh, I guess I do talk about passive active margins today. So um, just to let you know, passive margins, we have two kinds of margins. Passive margins, I might talk about this in plate tectonics lecture too. Passive margins are when there is no active plate tectonics taking place on that margin. It's just nice and calm. You know, like here, South Texas, you go to the beach, you go to Padre Island, it's a passive margin. Okay, there's no volcanoes or earthquakes happening here. There's no plate tectonics happening here. It's a passive margin. Active margins are the opposite. Active margins are when there's, uh, there's a trench, there's subduction, there's earthquakes, there's volcanoes. The continental shelf, this, there's a lot of information on this slide, by the way, that can explain these things to you. But um, you, they might, you probably can't read it. So. Oh, are you from um, Stone? Yes, sir. Oh, OK. That's good. So um, did you want to come in? And, OK, let me just finish it. Well, you, you can come on in, and then um, I'll just finish the slide, and then you can, right, sure. you can go ahead and present. Sure. Um, and then the passive margin. Remember, there's no earthquakes. There's no volcanoes here. And this is just where there's, um, you're going to have Continental margins are a lot wider and bigger and more developed. So here in South Texas, we have a very big continental margin. It's a very wide continental margin. That's why we have all the back bays here too, right? There's lots of bays and inlets and things like that. It's all because we're a passive margin, okay? So does that all make sense for number, what is that, number 15? And we answered number 17, right? Except, um, talk a little bit more about 16 next time. Okay. So we had a lot of, oh, number 21, we just answered number 21 too. Where are continental shelves more developed along passive margins or active margins? Passive, right. So more developed among passive margins. So there's a few more questions, and why don't we finish that next time, because we had to kind of, we had to test Go over the test today so we can finish those next time um, and then I'm going to turn it over to yeah and she'll talk about the stone writing center